So welcome to a second interactive discussion this afternoon. And uh, my name is Stephanie Emanuel. I'm the general manager of uh, Somos Connected Customer Marketing Division. And I'm really excited that we are having this discussion today with uh, Apps Flyer, Facebook, Uplift, and the New York Times. And we have a very international panel here. Uh, T actually came all the way from New York, and uh, she's asking to take it easy a little bit because she's still a little bit jet lagged. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we were working uh, on her plans as well because she's traveling to Athens out of all places this uh, weekend. So that's going to be interesting. So we're giving her some tips on taking some extra cash <laughs> and making sure she doesn't have to uh, queue uh, to get 60 euros on a daily basis. So uh, on a different note, I think what we heard from Gustav was absolutely uh, phenomenal and um, how to leverage uh, TV, but obviously the other forms of marketing, other forms of uh, paid marketing in terms of uh, user acquisition. And I'm sure that we'll hear a lot about uh, Facebook now and you'll have uh, quite a few uh, questions about that. But I would like to ask uh, the panelists to introduce themselves. So we're going to start with Daniel and also for him to share his top tip on paid uh, user acquisition for app promotion. Hi everyone, uh, Daniel from AppsFlyer. I'm the Director of Sales and Business Development. Uh, AppsFlyer is a, a mobile ad tracking attribution uh, measurement company. So we're working with all the app advertisers out there and helping them to track downloads from all their acquisition sources, as well as measure ROI, LTV, engagement, post install, helping them to understand which channels are the most effective for uh, continuing their user acquisition spend. Quickly, my top tip would probably be, um, depends what stage you're at, but always smart to, to start off small and, and test the different channels. Capture as much data as possible. Benchmark it against your organic data and then and, and have that data to make those smarter decisions going forward with whichever channels, whichever campaigns are converting the better users for you in the long term. Fantastic. Thank you, Daniel. And Becky, we heard from you, obviously, 15 plus one bonus uh, tip there. <laughs> so can you share an extra tip with us that is maybe not uh, Facebook related? Oh, not Facebook. Well, yeah, OK. So uh, one of our mantras at Facebook, Facebook is to move fast and break things. And I think that um, in this you know, market that we're in, and in mobile marketing, it's you have to move very fast in order to be able to take advantage of whatever the newest opportunity is. So whether it's on Facebook or any other network, um, I think giving the person at your um, organization who's responsible for, for your marketing the ability to move really fast. And, and to, everyone said this a lot today, but I, I agree. To test and, and to quickly jump on opportunities, I think, is pretty critical. That's great. And uh, Thomas, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and share your top tip with us? Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Thomas Summer, and I head up content marketing at AppLift. Um, AppLift is a mobile uh, marketing platform. Um, we enable all mobile app advertisers to um, acquire and re-engage uh, users at scale um, and across all channels. Um, quickly, one tip would be that um, I, not to silo your uh, user acquisition and advertising efforts um, from the rest of your marketing activities. Because um, we often talk about uh, paid users and free users, but in the end, they're all users. They're all the same. Um, and they're all, they, they will be the, the what, what really matters is your, um, is your audience. So in your processes and in your uh, mindset from the start, um, think holistically and do not, um, do not silo your, your uh, advertising activities uh, from the rest. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. So T, um, would you like to introduce yourself uh, officially and you know, talk to us about your holiday plans maybe <laughs> as well? I'll take any euros if you guys have <laughs> <laughs> um, Four tips as well, so I can give you a tip, you give me your euro. Just joking, but yeah, as Stephanie was mentioning, I work for New York Times, I'm a mobile marketing manager there, and I'm responsible for user acquisition, primarily for the iOS apps. We also have Android app, but I only work on iOS. Um, my tip would be, my one tip would be that for the app marketers out there, it's just to think about your app store page as a landing page and every single element on there can be tested and you should think about how those incremental changes could help you convert because you spend a lot of dollars or pounds or euros <laughs> converting people and I think all those incremental changes can really help and you know we've done experiments where um, 
where we've looked at everything from adding a video, removing a video preview, putting screenshots, different descriptions. Um, there's a lot of tools out there you can kind of leverage, but you can also do it yourself. And then with iTunes Connect at the moment, you can actually, if, if anyone signed up to the analytics tool there, you can actually look at how many people come into your app store, and that is something very new. So then when you're making these changes, you can actually see whether conversion rate impro is improved by those changes you've made. So those are kind of like little hacks that you can do. So something to think about when you're driving in store into the app, um, installs into the app store. We had quite a few discussions around, you know, because there are obviously many app developers in the room, some bigger brands, some smaller brands, but obviously there are certain platforms we can use uh, across the board, uh, small, medium-sized, and that advertisers can use, like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms. So, and I think everyone is very, very keen to hear more from Becky and also have the opportunity to ask her more questions. But before we open uh, the questions up to... Um, to, to you guys, I wanted to ask uh, Becky to maybe talk to us a little bit about the successful um, advertisers on the platform. So what do they have in common? What do they do well or what differentiates them? And obviously we're very, very interested in hearing what to expect from Facebook in the next few months. Yeah. Um, I think that some of the bigger advertisers on Facebook that have um, really seen success in terms of being able to drive uh, efficient installs, the lifetime value that they want, and then to be able to scale it, which is sometimes the tricky part. Um, a lot of it comes down to, like I said, be, being able to test quickly and take advantage of, of the um, performance gains that they're seeing. A lot of them have um, invested in terms of resources, um, people on their team who are focused on Facebook and can, because it, it's, it's admittedly not easy. Like, we have not made it easy the way that we've built um, our solutions. And so I think that the, the more that you can sort of invest in Facebook from a resource perspective, creative, um, you know, using partners that can help you measure it effectively, I think it's all very important. And by, you know, kind of recognizing that Facebook can be a, a huge driver of app installs and, and that should be a big part of the business, they've kind of put a stake in the ground and said, okay, we're going to invest here. I think that's been pretty, um, pretty, a pretty clear driver between the ones that have been able to do it very effectively and the ones that are kind of struggling a little bit. And then in terms of um, things that we're excited about, well, I mentioned already Instagram. I, I, I want to like, touch on that one again just because, I, like I said, um, there's a lot to be gained from being the first, and I feel like we haven't, we, we don't, we haven't had very many advertisers on Instagram to date, in, in part because a lot of our advertisers want performance-driven products. And so um, I just imagine just from all of you know, the marketers that I talk to that there's a lot of interest in Instagram and there's going to be a lot of... Um, people hoping to move quickly, but um, it's a new, it's a different median, so, you know, a different creative kind of expectation from the community, so the more that people can get, get prepared for that. So I'm really excited just to see that, just as an opportunity to have more inventory, you know, and a, a whole new audience of people to connect with. Um, and then also, I mean, we talked about this a little bit in the break, but there's, there's so much more coming just in, in the next several years even with um, outside of Facebook of some of the other properties that, that we're working with. So, you know, like, like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, you know, even Oculus. There's just, it's, it's hard to say what that will actually mean tangibly just yet because it's so, it's so new, but I'm, I'm pretty excited to see where, where we can take that for developers and what, what that means for the future of the way that we help people connect. Absolutely. That's... Um it's really interesting with Messenger and um, all the developments there that you announced, obviously, at um, F8. But what I would be, I mean, one of the things we constantly talk about is kind of leveraging data. So we saw the example from Liferando, what it actually meant and, and how um, using the right data set to actually make the right decisions. So what is kind of the role of, of data in, in all of this? Uh, Thomas, would you like to answer that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, it's... We often hear that um, data will be the oil of the 21st century. I think I, I completely agree with this. Um, and like oil, it needs to be refined in the process in order to uh, turn into petrol. Um, the same thing with data. So um, as an app publisher, you're, you're all sitting on a, on, a, on, a, on a mine of data that you could, that you could use to your advantage uh, for all sorts of purposes. And um, when I was talking about not siloing uh, advertising before is because this data, which you um, which you own as a as, a, as an app publisher, um, this data um, can be used uh, for for various purposes. Um, it's, it can be used for marketing. It can be used uh, activities such as uh, re-engagement within your app through push notifications, through um, um, through in-app messaging as well as it can be used for uh, advertising uh, 
Um, and within the scope of advertising can be used um, uh, in various ways, such as re-engagement. Um, it can be used for negative targeting. For instance, you know that a, that a user already has your, has your app. You don't want to show it to, uh, to, to them again, and you will just exclude the user from, this, from the, the pool of users that you're targeting. And um, obviously, it can also be used for lookalike uh, audiences and to create those audiences and uh, target the users that are most likely to, um, to resemble the users that, you, um, that are most valuable to you. And what, what matters most in this, uh, in this context is to um, really take the data that you have and um, segment it, look at it, uh, look at the segments that are most valuable to you, to your business, to your, to your own business KPIs, um, and from there, from there, define these segments and, uh, and, and go from there. So yes, um, be aware that uh, you, as an app publisher, have data, have, uh, are sitting on a, on, a mine, on a gold mine of data, and uh, you should make the most of it. So essentially, the role of the CMO is changing to become like a CTO slash uh, data scientist, uh, more or less. That's what I'm, what I'm hearing more and more in data, obviously, is fueling everything we, we do in, in marketing these days. But I think it's really great that we have um, T here with us because it's very rare to be able to actually speak to such a big brand and, and see what the, what the strategy is there. I'm sure we won't hear any confidential information from you, T. But what would be interesting to know is um, from a paid marketing perspective, that is still a small percentage of everything you do in order to promote the New York Times assets. So can you give us a little bit of information beyond the paid install? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Thomas touched on a really good point about data. And, you know, at the New York Times, we have a lot of data, we have a lot of content, and the user behavior coming to our app um, is varies a lot. So, you know, we have hundreds of uh, data points that we're tracking to give us a better understanding of how users are using our app and what they need to kind of be doing to get closer to the conversion funnel for us. So we're using data all the time to make smart decisions about what we should be testing. So although we spend, you know, money on paid marketing, um, a lot of it is focused as well as about the conversion. And I think sometimes as app marketers, we might get carried away by the download numbers. But as you know, you know, you lose a high percentage of your users within like day one to day seven and then day 30, you might not have anyone from the original pool. So, you know, a lot of the focus now is figuring out once you get the install, what should you be doing and what kind of, how are you leveraging data to convert those users? And some of the things that, uh, you know, we do and you, if you have, uh, you know, whether it's natively or you can utilize the tool, is we do a lot of A-B testing on those conversion points. So whether it's a, an in-app in purchase page or we're asking people to, um, you know, register or anything like that, we're testing those because we know that once we test those, we can figure out whether how we can improve those conversion funnel and how to improve the lift in conversion. So a lot of our effort now is looking at that and looking at in a way to kind of figure out how can we get better installs as well. Because if people are coming through and they're not completing those data points in the funnel that we're, we're needing them to do, we know that the paid install is not driving the right quality. So I'm not just looking at, did someone purchase? Great, of course, that's like the, you know, our metric where we can define a successful campaign or not. But I'm also looking on very early on on the install, are they engaging? Are they hitting those points that you want them to hit, whether it is to take action on a particular, you know, point in the funnel, read an article. For, for us, obviously, it's about usage and reading that article. And we know that if someone comes in and they register an account straight away, they're 70% more likely to retain, as in they'll come back to the app. If they've come in and they don't want to create an account, that means they want to remain anonymous and they're giving us less of their time or less about them. So we know that, um, you know, when we're driving installs, those are some of the things we look at. We look at how much time, like, people are coming in and spending time in the app from the different paid channels that, that are tracked. So if I'm working with multiple partners, which I do, um, some of them are in this room, you know, we're, we give that feedback back and we say, hey, the, the, the installs that you're driving is, is painting this picture of the user. It's not the right audience. We need to fix it. So the more data that you have, you should always be trying to share that with the people that you're working with because they can help you optimize as well. Um, so I think those are some really important things to really look at is on the data. And, and Stephanie's absolutely right. Like, you know, a lot of marketers now have to be completely data driven. And, you know, I can speak for myself that I'm always in the data every day <laughs> to figure out, like, you know, how can we improve our, uh, our campaigns and the conversion funnel as well. 
Right. Thanks for that, uh, T. And how do we measure all of that? I mean, we need to collect all these data points T was referring to and then in order to make the right decision. So what are the challenges uh, from an app promotion perspective? So, I mean, we've spoken about data um, as this general thing, um, which can then, once we start digging into it, be analyzed and, and looked at in so many different directions and each advertiser is, is really going to focus on, on the KPIs and the engagement metrics that are, are really relevant to their property and how they expect and want users to engage, um, not just on install, but of course um, beyond install and, and downstream through the funnel. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons why it's, it's critical to, to work with a tracking partner who can, you know, at the beginning of the funnel, provide access to all that data um, which will then eventually be tied back to, to the different channels to understand where the spend is, is going to work the best. Um, but there, there is so much more that, that then can be um, looked at um, in terms of the data. Um, just to give you know, a small kind of anecdotal example, and, and it's, you know, a user might be engaging on, on one device but then also engage with the same property on another device. Um, and, and so that, that cross-device targeting um, knowing where to engage with the user with the ads, or it could be that a mobile acquired user for, an, let's say, an e-commerce app then went on to make a purchase via the website. Well, that data is, is critical to the advertiser in terms of calculating the ROI from their, their original install campaigns because that mobile user has, has gone on to interact with the brand through other channels. Um, advertisers are able... Uh, with partners like AppsFlyer to, in a sense, sync up all that data and then in real time quickly understand how those users are converting, also to take it forward. Um, and it can go to a very uh, micro level, knowing that I've added um, genes to, to the cart but never then actually carried out the purchase, will then re-engage with me as a user based on that product and try to get me to convert. Um, so... You know, the, this data can be literally taken in so many different directions. It's, it's very important to understand how you want to approach it. Um, and I would totally agree that the marketers are having to become a lot more data savvy these days. Great. I think uh, we are now ready for questions uh, from you guys. I don't know where the microphone is. The only thing I would like to ask you is to uh, stand up and uh, state your name, company, and then ask your questions, because it's very difficult to see, actually, with all the, the light here. So who wants to ask a question? Thank you. Hi, my name is Josh Cartledge. I'm from Rebellion. Um, we're an independent game studio in Oxford. We've noticed a lot that video adverts have obviously been getting a lot more prominent and for us it makes a lot of sense um, because it shows off what we work on in the best light. Um, do you think though that they are going to make kind of image adverts obsolete or do you think that we need to that there needs to be a lot more harmony between them? Um, I, see, I think that video will take on more and more of the way that people communicate but I don't think that images are going to be obsolete. I have a feeling that it's going to be sort of a mix in fact, we're seeing some advertisers that are doing some interesting things where maybe they start with video as sort of more of an upper funnel way of grabbing attention. And then you can actually retarget those same users who have viewed the video with an image-based ad. Um, because there is always an element of, you know, the video could be optimized for viewing and much more of a brand objective, or it can be focused on an install, whereas the static image is squarely focused on an install. So, yeah, I, I can't see us getting to a place where it's 100% video and no one uses images anymore, but I do think it'll take a much bigger piece of the pie than it has right now. Thank you. Any additional comments with regards to video? I think um, just, I mean, recently, and, and not to plug our own content, but we, we recently released a, a, a gaming performance index um, report, and, and we did see that, that video ads were, of course, not only um, gaining traction, but also... Uh, responsible for bringing better retained users um, in the long run. I, I totally agree that, that images and, and static ads are not going not gonna to be obsolete. Um, every kind of ad can, can help an, a brand gain that visibility um, with regards to a user. And, and if they don't convert them with one ad, then perhaps that ad has played a part in the user then going on to convert via another ad um, later on. Okay, any additional questions from the audience? Okay, 
there's someone at the very back. Hi everyone, my name is Claudia dreyer Papel from CI Media. We are a large publisher of caller ID apps. And I have a question which uh, I think this topic hasn't been addressed here. Usually you either grow organically or you buy installs. But it seems that lately there's been a new practice of fake installs that some publishers use to drive their ranking up to the top. And that is quite an unfair business practice because I'm supposed to buy installs versus somebody else just faking them and then getting a higher ranking and from there enjoying organic downloads. So I would like to hear if anybody has come across this and I mean if the Google guy or anybody from Google is still here, I'd like to hear what they're going to do about it. <laughs> Okay, so from a publisher perspective, is there anything you can share, Thomas, as in, um, you know, being a media owner, have you noticed any fraudulent activity or...? Well, um, at AppLift, we, we, all, we, have, we have a publisher network, means we we're still uh, uh, have a vast network of, uh, of app publishers that we use to drive traffic and we're extremely <laughs> cautious about, uh, about fraud. We have a, a thorough vetting process and uh, uh, we do both, uh, both um, before we onboard the, the publisher and afterwards and during the campaigns. Um, so, um, so yeah, there, these these things do happen, but we, um, as far as uh, as far as we go, we try and uh, and avoid them as much as possible. And um, I agree that they're not so good for the ecosystem in general. I, I think I'd like to add to that is that it's not necessary. Like it's sometimes fake. It's just like instant traffic, right? Mm -hmm. So people Correct. within your marketing strategy, where wherever it is, you might want to utilize a portion of it because it helps with your ranking. But you know what you're buying. You're buying terrible quality installs. As long as you know that and you're paying a very low price and it's helping you, I think sometimes like some apps do use that. Um, I personally have worked on an app where in the very early day, where the app not the New York Times, we definitely don't do any instant traffic and we get a ton of organic volume, but. You you know, I have definitely worked where you know the app has no visibility, nobody knows about it, right? And so the struggle of our apps developers is like, how do I get there? How do I get in the top ten? How do I get a top twenty? And we know that the algorithm is a combination of rating, relevancy, rankings, you know. And so you have to tackle each one. And I think that sometimes people do have to use a bit of instant traffic to help them up and but they know what they're buying and I think um, it, it's not a practice that everyone uses but it's out there and I don't and, and, and fake or fraudulent stuff is completely different and myself I've experienced that and you know when we and, and it's crazy because when they actually when people are doing that it's just so obvious because all of a sudden we're like how is it possible because we know we can't generate that many downloads you know but you know and I think that sometimes uh, it does happen and we, we always find out who they are and we, we stop working with them, but I, I do think there is there's app marketers out there who do use a bit of uh, certain traffic to help with their ranking, and I think it's whether what you're working, you decide whether it works for you or not, and I think each of us has to make that decision. Absolutely, and also is it fair to say that the um, algorithms on the app stores are, are getting more sophisticated uh, yeah. as well, so it's not only about volume, but actually reviews and uh, mm -hmm. customization and so on. Do we have any additional questions? So we have someone at the back there, and then we'll go to that table and close to the door. Hi, my name is Saad Munir. Um, I work for Jana. We're, a, we're essentially a, a platform, an a Android app meant for uh, app discovery in the emerging markets. Uh, my question, uh, today we've heard a lot about networks and ad tech companies being used to drive user acquisition. Um, what are your thoughts, uh, and this is for the whole panel, what are your general thoughts on using direct publishers and app itself to drive user acquisition? The pros, the cons, um, and just your general experiences. Gee, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. I, I think, because I'm the only one that probably does a bit of both here. Um, I think it really depends on the bandwidth, right? Like what, what you guys... Uh, want to spend your time and strategy on and something for myself working for the New York Times you know we we have obviously a considerable big budget compared to some other brands out there to drive app installs and because of the size of our budget it, it's not easy for me to work with publishers directly and I do get a lot of publishers uh, also networks and partners that will come and say we want to work with you we don't want to work through you know an, an agency or anything like that 
and they have a preference to do that. And I get that preference because I, I do work with direct with certain partners directly. But you know, depending on the bandwidth, I think that some app marketers will not be able to do that. And so sometimes you have to use a combination of strategies that work for you. And I think it's it's when you are looking at working with someone directly, and if you have the time and the energy and the bandwidth to optimize and make sure that the, the relationship works for you, you really need to invest time in it, you know, and I think that that's something that you need to consider. So if someone's coming to you and saying, hey, you know, we have amazing inventory, I want to work with you, you really have to do your due diligence and say, is it worth the time for me to work with them directly or should I be using, you know, an agency if I have the budget to do it? And if you don't and it's just yourself and you're managing the budget, you have to then evaluate between these networks, like, you know, do you think there is worth working with because there are so many out there um, and you know my point is when I'm talking to anyone and they want to work with us directly it's like what can you offer me that no one else can because so if they can't come back and tell me at least like two or three things that you know someone else is not already offering then I won't work with them because I'm like I'm just buying exactly the same thing but I'm buying it through you so I need to know do you have some advanced targeting tools do you have anything else that no one else what is proprietary what is like things that you think you're you know wherever it is that you can do to really take my campaign to the next level so you need to ask them those hard questions because anyone that's really worth working with will know what the big differentiator between them and the other 800 networks out there are so that's that's just from my experience anyway so we, you wouldn't be asking Becky that question then now that would be a given that uh, you, you would be working with her. Fantastic. We had a question over here, close to the door. Someone wanted to ask a question? Is it working? I think so, yeah. Is it? Okay. Yeah, Sorry. we can hear you. I'm, I'm JV at Tune, uh, and that's a question from the table as per the request earlier. Um, I don't know about fake installs. But within the legal installs, there is still a strategy that consists of, you know, trying to be in the top position. So the question from the table is, what the panel think of charting as a as a strategy? Do you do you feel it's still relevant? Because we we still see a lot of people trying, mm -hmm. and everybody agree that you should look at high value users. But there's still a lot of people spending a lot of money to be on the top charts. So what does the panel think of that strategy? And is there any notable differences between the stores? So these two questions in one. Okay, who's volunteering can, to answer I can, that question? I, can try. Um, I mean, there's no denying it. Uh, being in the top 10 uh, top charts is, uh, is amazing exposure. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, what, what I will say now is a great user acquisition strategy, but you should not um, uh, mistake that for uh, a general uh, app marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. So, um, as we said before, um, you can use it partially within your uh, overall strategy, uh, using incentivized installs in order to uh, to boost your app into the into the ranks. Um, but you should not forget that will not bring you valuable uh, users in the long run. That will not bring you users that will uh, match your your own business goals. Um, and uh, on top of that. Uh, as Stephanie said before, the, uh, the, the algorithms have evolved, even though the, the one from, from the iOS app store that takes into account more uh, qualitative data rather than sheer, um, sheer number of installs right now. So um, do, do use it if, you, uh, if, if that's, that can uh, fit within your user acquisition strategy, but do not uh, mistake it for a more general marketing strategy. Great. Does that answer your question? <coughs> Great. Uh, any other table want to bring forward over here? We have a question, the second row. Hi there, I'm Liam from Music Magpie. Um, our cost per installs are kind of twice as high for Android as they are for iOS on Facebook. So, Becky, I was just wondering if that was something you see for other brands? Um. No, it, it definitely varies. I don't. I wouldn't say that I, I always see that it's t it's double. In fact, I think I've heard a lot of advertisers say that actually iOS can be more expensive than Android. Um, but it really it comes back to what the lifetime value is of the users. And so I, I mean, what we see is that our advertisers, you know, separate by de by device and they figure out what the CPI is and then what the LTV is of those different devices and then they treat them as very separate things and, and bid on them accordingly. Just to add to that quickly, um, 
you know, when we're, we started reporting to our clients on, on um, ROI from Facebook campaigns, and up until now, a lot of advertisers have probably been looking at average revenue per user and, and lifetime value. Um, benchmarking it against ROI, which obviously incorporates the cost of the campaign, um, can lead to some totally different conclusions. You can have a really great revenue generating campaign in terms of the users that are required, but the cost is so much higher than the other campaigns that are also maybe generating good revenue, but less. But those campaigns are the, the ones to focus on going forward because the advertiser knows that their return on investment is going to be that much better. And, and you know, it can be iOS or Android, and, and obviously, of course, who you're competing against with your ads. So that's, that's my addition. I think we have time for one more question before we break for lunch. And uh, again, if you want to share some uh, uh, top tips, uh, how to get some uh, euros or something along those lines, apps to use, anything like that, please share. Who wants to ask the, the last uh, question? In the middle. Yeah, just a quick question. What are some of the key things? Oh, uh, Andreas, I uh, run a company called Nibble Apps. We make recipe apps. Um, what are some of the key things you would recommend that people track uh, in terms of user actions within the app? Guess I'll well, that's start. probably one for you, Daniel. <laughs> It, it totally depends on, on what's happening in the app, right? And, and you know, what's the, the engagement and the actions that, that can be tracked in a gaming app are going to be different to um, those tracked in a travel app or an e-commerce app. And, and really, um, you know, by vertical, you're probably going to find um, similar activities being tracked. You know, if, if we're talking about gaming, reaching a specific level or sending friend invites or, or making in-app purchases, and those are just a, a few of, of obviously any, any actions that can be tracked. Um, the most important thing for, for every advertiser, there's, there's an approach to look at what's going on generally, but I think every app marketer should look at, at their specific product and really focus on, on what's good for them, not necessarily, you know, one gaming company might be tracking users that reach level five as an engagement <laughs> metric, um, but it could be that users in that game get to level five much quicker than in other games where um, level 10 would be more suitable. So, so it really depends on your needs. Um, any action can be tracked. Um, it's just a question of figuring out what's the right KPIs for you. Great. Thanks for, for answering that question. So we are breaking um, for lunch. And I think you know, we heard some really interesting uh, things from T, Becky, Thomas, and Daniel. So thank you so much for coming today and uh, sharing your knowledge uh, with all of us. So thank you. Thank you.